So uh, my you. name is Andrew Brown. Lots of you won't know me. Uh, those that know a little bit about Cornwall in uh, the southwest of England may have come across me. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm a, a new board member of SICAM and thoroughly enjoying uh, some of the strides we're, we're, we're doing to get things together. I'm a dentist, a conservationist, um, and I have quite a wide uh, natural history interest um, and I'm delighted to introduce Paul Cross from Bangor University, senior lecturer, who is the PhD supervisor of Dylan Thomas's, uh, Dylan, Dylan, Dylan's um, PhD, uh, a part of which he's going to talk about today. So I shall hand you over to Paul. All right, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to see some of these names. Some I am familiar with and have never met or would really like to meet. Um, and the rest of you, I'm just here, pleased to have made your acquaintance. So I'll just give a, a little bit of brief background um, about Dylan and his amazing beard. Um, so I met Dylan in 2017 um, and we were trying to fill a PhD position and either we had candidates of, of quite low sort of quality or people just not interested. And because I had contacts with Steve Rose from uh, Flintshire Beekeeping Association and Roger Patterson, which a number of you may know, and they were both interested in um, black bees and breeding programs. They said, oh, you should try this guy Dylan uh, in Belgium. And so they gave me contact details. Um, and I contacted Dylan. And whilst I was desperate to fill this PhD, I could not have hoped for a better suited uh, person for this PhD. Um, those of you who haven't met Dylan before in, in a sort of beekeeping universe, he is something of a beekeeping, he's a bee whisperer. Um, and yeah, he's quite magical when you watch him um, beekeeping. Uh, I definitely don't compare my own beekeeping skills to his because that would just be fairly demoralising. So I tend to compare myself to people who are really terrible at it and I just about pass muster then. Um, so Dylan, the original PhD description um, doesn't look very much like what Dylan has done since. I mean, he's sort of shaped it to his own ends and that's been really good and interesting. Uh, but he's sort of got involved in things like varroa resistance in bees um, up in North Wales and bee pre uh, breeding research. And has been you know, working with Alice Pinto as well, uh, has collaborated with, I see Marie is there, I know Grace is there. A range of people around who are sort of, um, interested in black bee uh, breeding programs. And so, with that, I think I will leave you to Dylan and the team. I'll turn my video and sound off. I'll monitor any questions you have to ask as we go along. Uh, just put them in the chat there, the question and answers, and I will keep an eye on them. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I feel like there was uh, a little bit, just a little bit of uh, exaggeration, um, or maybe that's uh, that's healthy enough. Uh, let's see. I have to. So, uh, good evening uh, tonight. Um, so, I'm Dylan. I have been, uh, I would say, well introduced by uh, Paul. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so, uh, I'm going to tell you. Well, I'm going to take you. Uh, to take you with me in a story um, and we're going to look at whether a single worker so a worker bee uh, can tell her colony stale uh, would be interesting if she could um, so i'm uh, affiliated to uh, bang university where i uh, do my phd and for this specific topic uh, i work together with uh, well, of course both my supervisors paul cross and anita Malotra, uh, both from uh, bang university as well and with uh, alice pinto and uh, Dora Henriquez from um, the uh, Instituto Politecnico de Braganza in uh, Portugal. Okay, and Alice is in the room, so uh, I have to be very careful too for her as well. Sure, uh, let's have a look. So first of all, um, there are some very important people or at same association I would like to thank um, because they and their efforts are like the reason that this study was performed. And so therefore, I would like to, uh, well, let's say to bring to your attention the uh, South Chloe Beekeeping Association. So it's a local beekeeping association in Northeast Wales. Um, and they have a focus on queen rearing, uh, trying to, let's say, breed local native, near native bees. 
And so, of course, they use the dark B, Apis mellifera, mellifera as a reference uh, for their uh, local stock. Um, and these breeders, well, these beekeepers slash breeders, queen rivers, um, so they try to look at, let's say, the the outer signs of worker bees, like the color of the abdomen, uh, like the wing uh, venation patterns, um, to breed for dark bees again. Um, so this uh, local beekeeping association, uh, they raised funding um, for running the uh, genetic survey we did across Wales, of which I'm going to tell you about now. Good, so what is a dark bee? Um, well, I guess that for this audience, um, it doesn't need a lot of, exp uh, a lot of uh, explanation. Um, but just uh, so you know, maybe for those who are new to SICOM and new to dark bees in general, so let's say that in Europe, um, we have more or less 10 subspecies of Apis mellifera, 10 subspecies of the Western honeybee. And these are uh, pictures of uh, all of these uh, subspecies, well, of worker bees of all of these subspecies. Um, unfortunately, number 10, which is the Adami subspecies native to Crete. Well, let's, let's assume it's, uh, well, it's, it's highly hybridized or it's even extinct, um, reading the, uh, let's say the last findings. Anyway, so uh, all these subspecies, they have their own, um, let's say, a local uh, habitat uh, across Europe. Um, and what is most interesting, and that's also the reason why we need all these translations on uh, all these uh, recordings for SICAM, is that our dark bee, so that's this one, our dark bee has the largest natural uh, habitat across uh, Europe. Yeah, so it really uh, it goes from uh, the British Isles uh, till uh, Russia, um, from uh, southern southern France to uh, Scandinavia. So it's very interesting because it also brings many beekeepers from many different countries uh, together. Unfortunately, our dark bee is, let's say, quite highly uh, endangered um, by imports of non-native bees and also by, uh, let's say, hybrids uh, like the buckfast bee, but primarily by uh, Ligustica, Carnica, and um, well, the buckfast bee, maybe especially in uh, Britain, that's a serious problem and some other countries as well. So just some background about what's a dark bee and where uh, does it come from originally. Okay, now why is it preferable to keep local bees? I just want to bring this to your attention because, well, why do we try to preserve dark bees at all? Or why would maybe uh, a Macedonian try to preserve Macedonian bees at all? So, it's important to know why we do what we do. Um, and therefore, um, just to give you, a, a, let's say a heads up, uh, we know that locally adapted honeybees have higher survival chances. Uh, so a couple of years ago, well, almost a decade ago by now, um, or even more than a decade ago, um, European institutions, they were together within, uh, let's say a COLOS study, where they compare different genotypes across Europe, across different uh, apiaries across Europe. And so they had in total, let's say, I believe 21 uh, apiaries across Europe. And at each apiary, they compare different stocks. So at each apiary, you had, for instance, 10 colonies of uh, Ligustica, um, 10 colonies of uh, dark bees, and 10 colonies of uh, Sicilian bees. But even more specific, it could be that you had, for instance, two times 10 colonies of dark bees, but one time dark bees from Poland and the other time dark bees or the other 10 were dark bees from uh, Southern France. Because it was not just about comparing subspecies, but really about comparing genotypes. And even within the same subspecies, you have different genotypes, different ecotypes, um, if you'd like to call it that way. So what they did was across these 21 apiaries, they set up all these um, colonies and without treatment against Feroa, they looked at the survival rates uh, of these colonies. Well, they looked at some extra things as well, but that doesn't matter uh, in this case. Um, but what was interesting was that if they looked at the survival rate over a period of three years, because uh, the experiment ran from um, 2009 to 2012, and they looked at the survival rate starting at one, which is the day where you establish the colonies. If that would already be zero, then you would have a serious problem in your experimental design. Um, but starting at one, over the years, it uh, decreased for both. Uh, so in green, you have the uh, local, locally adapted stock. As with each apiary, 10 colonies were from the local stock and the other were divided 
10 per 10 from uh, non-local stocks. Um, and if you looked at it, then there were differences. The differences only became greater. Um, and after a period of three years, there was a significant difference um, between, let's say, the amount of uh, colonies for each group which was still alive. So uh, looking at the local ones, 20% was still alive, whilst for the non-locally uh, adapted ones, there was just 10%. So why is it important that across Europe, we try to preserve our local tar B? It's because it's a local B, it's locally adapted, and so it performs best. It's best adapted. Um, well, I think that we're all very familiar with uh, COVID. So uh, I can go over this uh, quite uh, quite quickly. Um, another reason why it's important to, let's say, to keep your local stock, and from this point of view, it's not necessarily uh, well. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to be a local Darby. If it's just a local hybrid, that's uh, already good enough. But if it's a Darby, why not? Um, it's because you want to prevent the spread of diseases doesn't matter whether it's viral, bacterial, uh, or fungal, but by importing queens from, well, God knows where, um, you might bring in foreign uh, strains of viruses, of bacteria, or fungi. Uh, and it might be that your local bee is adapted to a local strain of this, of this disease, but not to the, um, well, to the foreign strain. A bit like with COVID, you have all these different strains and one strain is, let's say that the vaccine was more effective to one strain than the other. Um, the one strain caused more uh, uh, more patients uh, ending up in uh, intensive care units than the other strain. So therefore it's important to ban, uh, well, ban imports may be impossible, but to prevent imports, um, because that way you can prevent uh, uh, importing these, uh, well, potentially importing these uh, foreign diseases. So just uh, basically, uh, let's imagine that we're, uh, that we're in Britain, we're in the UK, um, and there are some beekeepers importing, uh, let's say, Slovenia, Slovenian queens, uh, so that's the uh, Corniolan queens. And these Corniolan queens, uh, they have a local Slovenian variant of uh, a certain virus. Um, whilst on the British Isles, you only have this uh, green variant. Uh, so not the uh, the red one, but the green one. But if you import this uh, queen from Slovenia, then this uh, red version enters into the UK. And the next year, so let's say you bring her into an apiary, or you buy multiple queens within an apiary, you will have both variants now, uh, the British one, the Slovenian one. But the next year, this queen, the imported queen, will also uh, produce drones. So if you have a mating uh, area, if you have a drone congregation area, within this drone congregation area, you will have drones uh, having, well, originating from local stock, so having the green uh, local variant, but you'll also have, uh, let's say, the rare variant, because the important queens, the imported queens, will produce these drones having the rare variant. So also beekeepers, because here you have a queen from a local beekeeper, bred from local stock, uh, because it's uh, she has uh, the green local variant, but also these beekeepers might end up with colonies having the foreign uh, the foreign disease strain, because this queen doesn't choose with well, which drones that she made. Um, well, I guess that she doesn't choose. I guess the drones uh, choose the queen. Um, so in that way, you will end up in, with a colony or with colonies. Well, here it says changing variant, but let's say that it will get both variants at the same time, both the local and the uh, foreign one. And if you then have a colony or a strain, which is not adapted to the foreign one, then, well, let's say you end up with uh, potentially severe colony losses. So that's another reason, keep it local, and therefore, in our case, uh, try to keep uh, our local dark bee. Okay, well, that's enough about why would you keep dark bees or why would you keep uh, local bees? Um, the first question we started with um, when, let's say, doing this uh, this study topic was, is there, a, uh, is there still a Welsh dark bee at all? Is there still a Welsh dark bee around um, or is she extinct? So what we did was, um, 
we launched a uh, like a survey online through the uh, Welsh Beekeeping Association. So I uh, sent a survey to all these uh, presidents of the local associations under the umbrella of the Welsh Beekeeping Association, um, and they spread it as well, and uh, asking for local bees. So I was not asking for dark bees. I just asked them, please, if you would be interested, participate if you have local bees. So if you have bees, um, which have, let's say, always been on your apiary, you have never imported queens um, into your apiary, so it's it's all local as far as you know of, um, then get in touch and I will, uh, I will arrange a meeting with you where I can uh, come over and uh, sample bees. Well, some beekeepers sample the bees themselves, that was a bit easier. Um, because otherwise I had to open up every colony myself and take out old samples. Um, and so uh, in the summer of 2018, I did like a road trip through Wales. It was lovely, um, visiting many beekeepers. And that's also the reason, let's say, uh, for which I, I learned to love, uh, let's say, British tea. I've always been more like a coffee person instead of a tea person. But on that road trip, every time I visited a beekeeper, I got offered uh, tea. So <laughs> that's the reason that, well, now I, I do like tea. Um, but I still like coffee as well, of course. Okay, so um, I visited all these beekeepers. Um, I also got information from free living colonies, wild colonies or free living colonies, um, no matter how you would uh, prefer to, uh, to call it. So in total, there were free, uh, four free living colonies and uh, 117 managed colonies. The type of management was very, um, well, let's say there was a, it was, it was a very wide spectrum of how these colonies were managed, but that doesn't really matter. Um, the free living colonies, well, that depended uh, some were, uh, well, some were sitting in trees, others were sitting in, uh, in a building. Um, it was quite a challenge to, um, well, sometimes get samples from, uh, from these colonies. Anyway. Um, so we had uh, over 100 colonies, uh, which were sampled. Um, we sampled multiple bees per colony. But at the end, for this case, uh, having a look at uh, what's left of, let's say, native AMM genes uh, within the Welsh stock, um, we analyzed one up to two worker bees per colony. Yeah. Um, why did we choose for worker bees? Well, we went for worker bees because a worker bee has uh, two sets of, uh, well, as, as two chromosomes, uh, one set coming from uh, the queen and the other set coming from uh, the drone. So um, that would give a better idea about the, let's say the, uh, let's say the AMM genes present within those bees. Um, for uh, doing this analysis, so for looking at, uh, let's say the genome, um, we made use of uh, SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, to specifically look at, um, let's say, to which extent is this genome uh, let's say M lineage, which would be Apis mellifera mellifera, um, or is it C lineage, which would be, well, derived from Carniolan bees or from Ligustica bees, um, or to some extent even Buckfast bees, because Buckfast bees have a lot in common with uh, C lineage bees. Um, so what's a SNP precisely? A SNP precisely is, um, let's say, one spot within the genome. Um, so let's say that this uh, this purple one is uh, a dark bee, or it represents a dark bee, it represents a carniolan bee, and then the uh, orange yellowish one represents a um, well a ligustica bee. Um, and you see that these uh, these three bees, they are very alike. Yeah. Um, so these strains are nearly completely the same, except for one coat. Yeah, so there is one uh, one spot within the whole uh, series here, where there is a different letter, yeah, A, G, T. Um, and so this spot is called a SNP. Yeah? And because, uh, let's say, because the, um, the code differs specifically uh, for these three subspecies uh, over here, this SNP is informative for the subspecies we're talking about. So if you would look at the genome, and we would look at this specific spot in the genome, and it would say it's A, then we know, oh, that stands for mellifera, for AMM. If it would be like G or T, then we know, ah, that's for a subspecies from sea lineage bees like Carnica or uh, Ligustica. Okay, now we looked at several SNPs 
Um, so uh, specifically, we looked at like uh, around 62 SNPs um, using the uh, assays developed by uh, Dora Henriquez. Well, not just by Dora, but by a large team. Um, I'm not. I'm not calling. Well, I'm not uh, writing all their names. It's too. Uh, it's too much. So it's just at all in this one. Um, but uh, Dora and uh, let's say a collaborative team of uh, many people. Um, they have developed uh, SNP assays, uh, four different SNP assays. It was published in uh, 2018 in scientific reports. Um, and of all these uh, four SNP assays, we used two of them. Um, two of them, presumably because it was advised that these two would, uh, let's say, would give overall the best results, um, or let's say results which would be equally well um, as uh, combining all four uh, all four different assays. Um, and just to give you an idea, so you know that the, uh, well, maybe you don't know uh, yet. So the honeybee has like uh, 16 chromosomes. Yeah. Well, drones have half of it, but like a worker bee or queen has like 16, uh, 16 chromosomes. And so these SNPs, I remember a SNP is just one spot somewhere on the genome. Um, for which we have these uh, different codes, different letters, um, and uh, for the for the development of this uh, of these SNP assays, they look for SNPs across the whole uh, genome. So across all 16 chromosomes, uh, SNPs were identified, which were useful for identification of uh, subspecies. So M lineage, Apis from Lifra, AMM, or C lineage bees. Um, as for this comparison specifically. Okay, now what happened? We had a sample, huh? so we went sampling, we had all these bees, um, so these bees were collected, went into a freezer. Um, when we had these uh, samples for processing, we, uh, first of all, we collected the right front wing or right forewing um, for uh, wing morphometrics in case that would be interesting. Um, and uh, later on, well, just a few seconds later, um, we uh, collected the uh, thorax. So uh, you have the head, thorax, abdomen. So we used the uh, thorax for uh, extraction of the uh, DNA. Um, well, this is a very simplified version, of course, but doesn't really matter. Um, and later on, the uh, DNA extractions, uh, so prepared from using these thoraxes, uh, they were uh, sent to a lab for genotyping. And then you get like uh, this file with all these letters and coding, doesn't really matter. But just so you know, you don't get a nice result immediately. You just have a, an Excel sheet and then uh, let's say the real job starts. Okay, so um, now what were the, what were the results? Um, uh, so when we uh, say when we had these, uh, uh, this uh, Excel file, um, and we started working with it, which results came out of it. Um, so interestingly, well, let's say that um, for some explanation, we have two colors within this uh, graph. One color is, uh, well, blue, the other one is orange. Um, like I said before, we used a SNP set or SNP sets, which were developed to, um, let's say, compare M lineage bees, in this case, Apes from Lifra, uh, from C lineage bees, uh, so Ligustica, Carnica. Um, so therefore, in this case, two colors, one stands for M lineage and the other one stands for C lineage. Um, well, I'm not asking everyone because that would be too difficult, but you can guess for yourself um, which one is, well, which one is which. So um, blue, of course, is uh, AMM, is our dark B. And um, orange stands for the C lineage piece. Now, each of these lines um, or columns um, represents one tested worker bee. Yeah? Um, and the percentages uh, which are standing next to it, so here at the left, uh, these are probabilities. So probabilities for saying, what is the probability that this bee was a Melifera, a AMM, M lineage B. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't automatically, well, it doesn't directly uh, tell you the, um, let's say the purity 
Uh, we, we often, well, as beekeepers, we often speak about purity. In this case, it doesn't directly, let's say, talk about purity, but about probability. Probability for these uh, bees to be, well, whatever color is, is more present, let's say. Um, so, of course, we had reference uh, samples, reference samples uh, for Ligustica, for Carnica, uh, for uh, AMM, and so for Darn B samples coming from across Europe, from all these uh, populations, to which probably you are very familiar with uh, locally. Um, and then we had our, uh, our, our Welsh stock. Yeah. Um, and looking at the Welsh stock, well, I must be honest that I didn't expect but I would not have expected this result. So um, you see that there are some, uh, let's say some, uh, some individuals, some worker bees with relatively high admixture, and so hybridization uh, signs at mixture, um, where we go uh, over 50% of admixture. Um, so that's when, uh, when these orange bar, well, when the columns uh, are, are orange for more than 50%, yeah, so crossing this line here. Um, but at the same time, most colonies, or most of them, actually um, had like less than 70% uh, probability um, of being mixed. Um, so uh, that was actually quite a quite a good result, um, and a sign that within this Welsh stock, I mean, there were even some, let's say, some outliers of colonies which had like uh, these ones here. Uh, and these ones, that was like uh, over 90% of being, uh, well, over 90% probability of being just Apis mellifera from Lifra. Um, and so that was interesting also for the beekeepers because that means that, yes, of course, these bees are hybridized. They're not pure AMM. But then again, in Britain, they often speak about well, native and near native. So uh, most of these ones would be very near native, and some of them would be near, near, near native. Um, so overall, a good result. To give you an idea about where we uh, where we sampled uh, for these uh, for these bees, um, so over here you uh, you find a map of Wales. Yeah. Um, so uh, well, let's say that for those not familiar with Wales, let's say that over here more or less you have the border with uh, well England, which is right of it. Um, and all of this is uh, Wales. Um, South Clwyd Beekeeping Association, the one who, uh, let's say, raised uh, the money for this uh, study, uh, they're located more or less here. Well, they have members across that area, of course. Um, so every dot on this map uh, gives you an idea about where we sampled or where I sampled or where samples were taken. Um, and the color gives you an idea about um, the integration, which was found within this uh, orient mixture, which was found within this sample, yeah. Um, and interestingly, so well, it, there are four well four color codes. Uh, so red means um, that there was uh, quite high uh, at mixture, um, going up to blue, where you have minimal amounts of a mixture. So that means that the blue ones uh, are most, let's say, pure. Uh, apes mellifera and lifra, and the red ones are, uh, let's say, are the least apes mellifera or least pure uh, apes mellifera and lifra. Um, interestingly, the better ones, let's say, um, were all found in North Wales, yeah, in isolated areas like this one here uh, near the Glen Peninsula, um, of which we also know that there are, well, most beekeepers over here don't treat against uh, Varroa. Um, and here, of course, uh, well, the region where the uh, where the uh, beekeeping association of South Clwyd is active, and so uh, is also active in breeding and that kind of uh, stuff. So it might be well, it doesn't mean, or this doesn't mean that across, let's say, mid and South Wales, there would be no uh, very pure bees or very pure AMMs. Uh, maybe we just didn't found them, or I wasn't able to reach out to these beekeepers. Um, but it's very interesting, at least, that in the north, we do find these, uh, let's say, pure individuals, or almost pure dark individuals. OK, that is a brief introduction. Um, 
by the way, I'm looking forward, and probably uh, you too, uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, talk of uh, Victoria Buswell, um, because she will talk, well, I'm now talking about whales specifically, um, but she will tell us in a couple of weeks, I believe, um, about the UK in general. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that uh, to that talk, and uh, I hope uh, to see you all in the, in the public then when she's uh, inspiring us with her findings. Okay. So going on um, about this, uh, well, this colony tale. Sorry. So in general. There is a um, there is a balance between the information which you will get out of an analysis and the costs of that analysis. Yeah, um, and in this case, in well, in most ways, it depends on the amount of bees you would like to have tested per colony. Um, so therefore, in general, it's easiest to just use one bee per colony. Yeah, because that's cheapest. The same way, it's not ideal. Because we all know that a queen gets mated by multiple drones. So if you would analyze or do research on just one work bee per colony, then it only gives you information of let's say one sister group. Yeah, so that's that's very that's very limited. Um, and therefore we were thinking, given the um, so given that for some colonies uh, we tested two bees per colony in the well in what I uh, said previously um, we had this idea well it seems having talked to this to these beekeepers um, because that's what you do when you have well your cup of tea with each of them um, it seemed that many areas were actually quite isolated so people kept local bees um for as long as they remembered or that's what they at least said in the beginning originally um so the idea was well maybe in such regions maybe hybridization stabilizes which would mean that like on an island well they would let's say live on figurative islands um that if you would test multiple bees of the same colony that they would all give more or less the same result. And in that way, well, in that case, it would be enough to just test one bee per colony, which would be very cost efficient. Um, so like I said, when taking the samples, we collected more samples. Uh, well, we collected multiple uh, worker bees per colony. And so um, for this specific case study, uh, we analyzed 10 worker bees per colony. Uh, so we picked out 17 colonies from the original uh, data set, which uh, so they were tested, or well, some bees uh, for these colonies were already tested. Um, and for these colonies, we picked out uh, eight more work bees. Yeah? So in total, there would be 10 work bees uh, for each of these 17 colonies. Um, these 10 work bees, well, in this case specifically, we looked at uh, both the DNA using these SNPs again, um, and uh, at these uh, well, at their wings. Yeah. Um, so looking at the wing, just so you know what we uh, what we looked at, but most of you will be very familiar with it probably. Um, we looked at three wing indices, being the uh, cubital index, the Hantel index, and the discodal shift angle. And here you see, uh, well, it's a bit about how you uh, would measure them. Um, but uh, if you're interested by that, I would say uh, just look up uh, on Google um, CBC B Wing. Um, and there is a very, very good uh, uh, informative guide on how that works. Um, but it's basically just about distances and angles. Um, it's, uh, it's very simple um, and interesting to do. Uh, if you would have uh, some spare time. Anyway, for all of these cubital indices, uh, for all of these uh, wing indices, which are relatively common used by beekeepers uh, to do, well, to make decisions on breeding, um, for instance, uh, which colony are we going to, uh, to rear daughter queens from um, in terms of breeding dark bees. So uh, we looked at the wings, we looked at the uh, DNA of the individuals, and we looked at um, the uh, 
or it's a SNP test of the individuals and a SNP test of the pools. So in this case, we extracted the DNA of each of these individual worker bees, um, but we did not, but, but, um, sorry, but we didn't just uh, only test the DNA of the individuals, we also made a pool. So that means basically that we, um, we make sure that these 10 extractions all have the same concentration. And then we uh, mingle a bit of all of them into one small jar, um, or let's say like a, like a, like a dip. Um, and then you have a pool of DNA. Yeah, And so we tested this pool as well, because this pool actually would represent the colony. Um, and to look whether there would be a difference between what a colony would say, so the pool, um, and what the, uh, the individuals uh, would say. So like I said, there were 14, no, 17 uh, colonies, 17 colonies in total. Um, and these 17 colonies, so four of them um, seem to have like uh, large ranges of values, um, a bit, uh, well, unexpected. Uh, so um, just to give you an idea, so here we have on the X uh, axis, we have the, uh, the uh, colonies, yeah? So, well, they all have a letter, A, B, C, uh, and so on. Um, so each one is a colony over here. And this one, mLineage gives you the, uh, again, the probability, yeah, um, as a result of the SNP test, the probability of, um, well, being a, uh, well, being Apis mellifera mellifera. Um, each small black dot, uh, so each column, each column represents a colony, um, and each small dot represents a work bee from this colony. So for each column, you would have, or you will have 10, small black dots. Well, sometimes you wouldn't uh, be able to see them all because they overlap, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the, there were four colonies, which uh, let's say have very, very high variation. Um, and so I uh, reached out to these beekeepers to see whether, uh, well, whether they would have an explanation for it. Um, and so in this case for uh, colonies A, F, I and well, in this case, I, I, I never remember it's J or well, let's say J. Um, uh, yeah, so for these four, um, the beekeepers, well, we started thinking and they went through their, uh, well, luckily they had log books, my God. Um, and so they went through them. Um, and in these cases, it appeared, unfortunately, um, that there had been, uh, well, several things were possible um, but uh, in some cases it was like uh, a beekeeper who had uh, bought a colony elsewhere and then requeened it um, but then uh, well it seemed like with uh, uh, with sampling that bees from the well from the original queen which was on there were samples which were let's say corniolan bastard well corniolan hybrids um, so um, for each of these four colonies it seemed like it did not met the requirements uh, which we put in the beginning, like all these colonies are completely local, non-imports over many years. Um, so these were uh, discarded, ending up with this uh, figure, um, making clear that, uh, so of course the idea was we want to have a range of colonies. Uh, so we want to have a colony if one bee tests, let's say, 50% uh, probability, then all other bees would also have to present like 50% probability of being AMM. The same for a colony of which one bee would be like 80%, uh, then the other bees would also present like 80% uh, probability of being uh, AMM. Um, and uh, well, like you can see, it was very interesting to see that, um, let's say our hypothesis was kind of true. Um, so uh, each of these colonies originate from, well, an apiary quite isolated, completely local, um, or local bees, no recent imports. Um, and it seems like you can see all the probabilities for one colony more or less are, um, let's say, within each other's neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so it seems to indicate that hybridization stabilizes over time. Um, if you 
leave out, uh, let's say, new imports or recent. Uh, well, if you leave out new imports, of course. Um, now we also look at the wings, and here you see, well, you see purity, but let's say that's probability, yeah. Um, so we compare it with uh, wing indices, just to, uh, well, just to to know would it be true. Now I must I must tell you, the problem with wings, with B wings, is that they, it's a technique which was developed to determine the subspecies, yeah. So looking at wings and the wing the typical wing values it's all designed um, or it's all made up just to determine subspecies it was never uh, developed for well for getting an idea about the degree of hybridization it can tell you whether a bee is hybridized or not uh, that's true but it cannot tell you the degree of hybridization um, anyway so what we did was, uh, of course, like I told you, we looked for these uh, for these three uh, wing indices, uh, the cubital index, the discal shift angle, and the Hantal index. And then beekeepers, they generally use the combination of three. So that means that only the wings, which uh, let's say tick all three boxes, only they are considered to be, let's say, a typical or good mellifera wing. Um, and then, well, you know, it also says average, but let's just uh, neglect that for a moment. So when we looked at the pooled results, so uh, uh, being the pool which uh, which we made out of the DNA of all these uh, individual worker bees, um, and we compare the pool, which represents the colony level, um, with uh, the wing indices, then we see there are huge differences. Uh, so for instance, uh, well, in this case, the, uh, the pool, well, the SNP result of the pool uh, said that the um, well said that the colony would be like more or less well a bit less than 50 percent probability of being AMM. Whilst well you see these are empty columns, it just says zero. Um, so the cubital index according to cubital index, and uh, of course then also the uh, taking the, taking into account all three um, uh, wing indices, this colony was just uh, zero percent probability of being AMM. Yeah, zero percent. Whilst genetically there is still well, there is quite part of uh, AMM genes uh, present in it. In a table format, which might be a bit more uh, well, <laughs> giving a bit better uh, overview. Um, and so here we have all these colonies again, um, and then uh, well, the pool results. Well, well, this is uh, well, you, you should read it as a percentage. So this is uh, 49%, 57%, 61%, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, interestingly, it was, well, interesting, it seemed that when you have uh, colonies which score good, yeah, um, then it's not necessarily true that the wings are also, let's say, good or typically mellifera. Because for instance, we had, um, we had colonies uh, which, uh, let's say, using the SNPs genetically, a very high probability of uh, being AMM, like 93% or even 84, 82%. Um, but when you looked at, uh, let's say, the swing indices, and then of course the total as well, um, then we have very varying results. Yeah? So one of them, uh, yeah, there was 80%, but the others were 30 or 40%. Um, and now I must admit that in this case, with these wings, it's never sure, um, because in some cases, in some cases, it might give a let's say a high or a positive result, um, typical for AMM, because of coincidence. But in some cases, it just scores high, because beekeepers are actively breeding on the right figures for these indices. Um, but they're not aware about the genetics of their bees. Like for instance, over here, um, there were colonies, well, there were beekeepers. Uh, I know this uh, I know this is true for, for this colony over here. So um, it's a beekeeper and he was breeding for, uh, well, for local AMMs using wing indices. And you can see that for these two wing indices, this colony performs quite well. And so nine, uh, sorry here, uh, nine out of 10 worker bees had a negative discodal shift angle. And nine of them uh, had a, um, a, well, let's say the, the, the right Hunter index, yeah? But genetically, it was only for 62% probability uh, an AMM. 
And so by breeding for these specific, let's say, values, um, you might end up with bees which have the perfect wing of a mellifera, but genetically, it's well, it's not necessarily, uh, let's say, high probability of being mellifera too. Now, interestingly, and that's, um, I think I'm getting to the end of, uh, of the talk, um, which level of variation is acceptable for beekeepers to work with? Why am I asking? Well, because if you look at this, then, okay, it's true that, uh, let's say, the values, uh, so the probabilities measured for all these uh, individual worker bees, well, they're close to one another, sure, but there's still this variation, yeah? Um, and so in that case, it would be important for beekeepers to know or to have an idea about what's an acceptable level. So if you look at the data, um, well, it doesn't really matter too much, but let's say that we have these uh, these 13 colonies, yeah, which were local, local, local. Um, this one, this column, um, it's like um, the probability, the lowest probability for uh, well, measured within all 10 worker bees of that colony. This one is the uh, the maximum. So let's say that the, the first column, for instance, would give you this one, yeah, this worker bee, and the uh, second, the third column would give you like uh, the upper one, yeah. Then we're going to watch how far are going to look, how far are they away from uh, the pool result? Uh, so from the probability which was measured which was measured by genotyping the pool of these 10 uh, individual DNAs DNA samples. Um, and in that case, if we look at it, then uh, so here for instance, uh, if you look at this one, then uh, that would be like uh, one percent away from the uh, so the lowest one would be one percent away from the pool results. Um, well, sorry, that's, uh, that's um, uh, yeah, 1%. Well, if you, uh, well, this is, yeah, that's 1%. Um, the uh, highest one would, on the other hand, be 13% uh, away, yeah? So I divided them into uh, three categories where, um, so the first category would mean that all the results, yeah, so all individual worker bees, all their probabilities would be somewhere within the range of, let's say between zero and 10% uh, um, of this, uh, of, the, of the result of the pool. So that means that if the pool would be, uh, let's say 70% probability, then the lowest value for an individual would be 60% and the highest value would be 80%. Yeah, um, same for this one. So if uh, our category two would be that um, in case of, uh, let's say the pool would say probability of 70%, then that would mean that all worker bees, all individuals would plot somewhere between um, 55 and 85% probability. Yeah, um, of course, the smaller this range, the better it would be, but that probably also depends on the specific population. Um, in this case, for the colonies we uh, we uh, well we studied uh, in this uh, case study. Oh, so in this case study, the colonies we studied, um, it seemed that uh, let's say this uh, second category, so category two, um, was best, and uh, let's say that more than ninety six percent of uh, well, for more than 96% of, uh, of all tested colonies, um, all individuals fell somewhere between uh, within this range of, uh, let's say, 15% uh, under or above the, uh, the pool result. So personally, having in mind that every, every extra B has an extra cost or means an extra cost, um, I think that's an acceptable level to start working with if you're in an unknown but isolated population. So conclusions are that local Welsh bees still resemble the native dark bee genetically. Um, there is stock available for setting up breeding activities locally adapted. Um, there is a need for protection of this unique genetic stock, especially for those 
who uh, for those which are uh, well specifically uh, or specific or have specifically high um, probabilities um, like in North Wales um, I would also add to this one that it would be uh, it would be worth uh, having a let's say a more intense look at mid and south Wales um, Worker bees exhibiting wing indices, which are typical for dark bees, are not necessarily likely to be less hybridized. Um, uh, going back to this one colony, which had a probability of, let's say, 62% of being AMM, um, but of which uh, the wings, for instance, said that this uh, this is like a, like a nice mellifera bee. Um, and in isolated regions, in the absence of recent imports um, and new imports, um, hybridization seems to stabilize, um, causing, let's say that in such cases, if you would test one worker bee, then that might be enough to get a rough idea about the, uh, let's say, composition of your uh, of your colony. So um, this red cross <laughs> over these uh, wings, um, yeah, let's uh, maybe focus a bit less on the wings and. Um, try to have uh, a closer look on uh, well on the DNA. Okay, well that was all. I would like to uh, thank you for uh, well for your attention to, to my uh, to my crazy Belgian accent English. Um, and if there are any questions then Paul uh, shoot. Yeah thanks Dylan for that. Um, can I can I stop my presentation or how uh, well, people may ask you to flick back to um, okay, that's good. slides and that sort of thing. Uh, so I've got seven minutes um, uh, left in this meeting. I've got to go to another meeting. Um, so I'll kick off with a question from Joe, Joe Lidicum. Um The, the cor correlation between DNA and morph morph morphometry seems low. Do you have any data for a correlation between appearance, okay, so how it looks, and DNA analysis, i.e., if a colony looks uniformly native, I'm guessing that means sort of dark bee-ish, uh, does the DNA bear this out? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, and uh, well, I would just advise to, to attend Dora's presentation. So Dora Enriquez will, um, will present about, uh, let's say, uh, DNA and, uh, and color of bees. Um, from my own experience, because amongst these uh, amongst these Welsh bees and uh, amongst other bees as well, which I tested, um, there often are bees with uh, yellow bands. Yeah, so what you would call like a typical buckfast bee. Um, but uh, surprisingly, they often did not really have, let's say, bad probabilities. Um, so I even had uh, in well, there was a, a very surprising. Um, a very surprising case where I had a beekeeper um, and he had several colonies and we sampled uh, well a couple of colonies of his um, and some colonies were completely yellow that you would say this is completely hybridized and some others were his uh, well he was proud of them that was his, his native stock um, and eventually it turned out that the native uh, well the native looking colonies were uh, 